topic is the art of the story. And it's going to be really fun. We've got some of the most fabulous artists here to share. Pete will try to, try to get out of his you know, comfort zone and talk a little bit. So, uh, we have Sonny Wampler, Sandra Wampler, is going to be sharing some of her amazing stories and inspiration behind her art. And we have Trevor Swanson, who he's a great storyteller, but he also has a job here today to be like an emotional support for Pete. Is that right? Where's <laughs> Can you be my emotional support? <laughs> in Australia. I thought I'd go for a quick surf trip and never came home. Um, it was an experience and a half looking for waves and the next thing I knew I got an experience in life. The experience was just for the waves but what I realised we were all so dang similar. And so along the way I found out that I could paint a long time ago and from that came these pieces. So I've been struggling to come out of my shell, so please forgive us, we're all nervous. <laughs> so I'm sure I'm going to have more to say later, right? Yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Barbara Rudolph, and um, I'm one of the local artists. This is my 15th year in a row, I can hardly believe it, um, with the celebration of fine art. But um, I think um, about 10, 12 years ago, I started a kind of was inspired by my late father uh, to paint birds, um, kind of accidentally. So a lot of my paintings have a little bit of humor to them, and they usually will have a bird as well. So I will, we'll talk a little bit about storytelling coming up, but thanks for being here. Yay. Okay, so, so every painting tells a story, 
Every mixed medium work tells a story. One of the things I love about Sonny's work is the overlay and the juxtaposition of people from different places. She puts them in this make, make believe place, and so much goes into that. So I have a couple of your pieces that I love, and you have used your travels, your photography background, and your beautiful mind of creativity to put together. So tell them a little bit about why you combine your people and animals and how you do it. Uh, yeah, so my work um, is really about conservation, preservation, and restoration. So I look at the planet and what's happening to the animal kingdom, um, the earth in general with the pollution, and all that uh, downside of things. And I'm looking, the, the series that I have here is called The Future's Past. So it's a futuristic view of the world in, in gives me a hope for the future in to, to where um, the natural world and the civilized world are in harmony with one another. And you can see in my pieces that the animals are um, not afraid of each other, not afraid of people, and vice versa. Um, I saw a film many, many years ago called Kind of Scotsy, which was a Native American term for um, life out of balance. So I use a lot of symmetry in my work because it's a balanced life in balance. So um, on these pieces, I like to juxtapose, you know, um, architectural elements with um, with the animal world. And I think about uh, the way the original way that I started creating some of these was from dreams. And I think I started thinking about the way you dream and the way you place things in odd places in your dreams. And so then I started to create more that way. So this work has evolved from the beginnings of, probably I started the series of, uh, for this type of work in 2009, but it's really morphed and developed into what it is now, um, a, a really complete body of work. But um, I take these, um, these two particular pieces are from a, a sub-series called um, in paradise. So these, the pieces with these women, they're in paradise, in, in this idealistic world where there's harmony. And what what is really um, rewarding for me is when I um, place a piece in someone's home, they often will write me or uh, text me or see me the next time and just thank me and say they smile every time they go past the piece because it's a place they want to be. It's, it's not, it's a, it's a happy place, it's an interesting place, and there's, um, I've got so many things in these pieces that, uh, that you have to really stand there and study them, and uh, <coughs> you keep discovering things that you might not normally see, and so there's something always new and interesting in them. Um, and I do bring the outdoors indoor. This piece over here, um, the foreground is Versailles in France, and the background is a building, uh, it's actually the Capitol building in um, Madison, Wisconsin. So you would think it was Europe, but it's, it's not. Um, I do take my camera everywhere I go um, and take pictures of architecture and elements that I might use. So every single element in here is photographic. Every flower is an individual photographic. Every animal, I photograph all the animals. Um, this is snow in the foreground here. That's uh, one of the bridges in um, Central Park um, that I've, you know, recreated. So I don't know if that is round enough for. <laughs> you so, want me to say more? Well, so another thing I think, uh, another thing about your work is. Um, the overlay, what, what other media are you using? You have photography? Okay, so um, I, I take all the photographs and I have a vast library of photographs as well from shooting for 30 years. So I have a lot of black and white negatives um, that I use and combine. I, I do use um, uh, Photoshop to create the imagery digitally. Um, I'm layering several layers of, of images together to form the final piece. I print them out on uh, a mylar film. I do a painting 
on my substrate, um, and and then I lift the emulsion off the film onto my substrate. So it's kind of a complicated several step process, but it gives such a beautiful result. Um, and it's I use metallic paints too, and so it gives a nice glow. And, um, and when they're hung in your home, they change throughout the day depending on the light. So they're kind of interesting that way. So you have a piece that we were looking at earlier that um, is the Taj Mahal, but it's in Central Park, and it's there's actually it's not Central Park, but it's in the it's in the woods in Upper State New York, yeah. and the, the animals are from a safari in India. Yeah. yeah. So it's um, so the Taj Mahal, you know, if you've ever been there, it's just it's pretty flat, and um, there's just a jillion people there. So my work can't move all those people. So so to create this isolated place, I placed it in the forest with um, some of the deer that I photographed while in India on, safar on a tiger safari, which I didn't get to see a tiger, but I did get to see a lot of deer and other weird animals. Um, but um, so yeah, I photograph all these things and then place them all together. And I like to work intuitively. I don't I don't um, plan out my work and draw it. I don't sketch it out. I like to let it happen. So I try to tap into that part of the brain that just lets things flow um, like a stream of consciousness and just um, not be too um, technical. And that way the work doesn't look contrived. So do you ever, does anybody wonder what her dreams are like? <laughs> she dreams beautiful things. So, and why do you like the ladies from that era? Um, I just have always admired that era of painters, and I love the costuming, and I thought originally about uh, higher models and bringing costuming and photograph them, and then I thought, you know what, I love art history, and I love this period, and I think it would just be so cool to combine um, somebody else's painting that's from, you know, 100 years ago or more with a contemporary artist. And it's it's like a collaboration on my end. They don't know they're collaborating with me. But it's like, I'm collaborating with them, I feel like. And that is a real um, privilege and an honor um, because I love those painters. And um, they're painters like, this is um, a Frederick, these both actually are from Frederick Layton painters, uh, paintings um, from, He's a British painter from the 1800s, and um, and I like a lot of um, John Singer Sargent. Um, I use a lot of his paintings in my work, um, but it's um, it's appropriation, and uh, that's what it's called when you borrow from other people's work. Um, and um, uh, it just it just um, the other thing that it does is it helps introduce younger people to these artists that they may never have heard of. I, I'm amazed when I meet someone that's never heard of John Singer Sargent, and so it's nice to let them, oh, you've got to look this up, Google them, <laughs> Google it, and because they're so into their phones, so they do, and they're like amazed. So it's 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 fun, it's sort of reintroducing their, um, it's almost like a, um, musicians who sample a music. So it's like resampling uh, these images into new contemporary work. I think they would approve. I think they would like where you put their people. I hope so. <laughs> All right, we'll give you a little break, and I'm going to move over here to Miss Barbara. And um, you, along with birds, there's another thing that's frequently in your paintings, which is books and trinkets and collectibles. And um, if you really take the time, and hopefully you will take the time to go visit each of their studios, um, you can see that she definitely has a sense of humor. I'm just going to hold this one up. Because I can. Crime and punishment. Crime and punishment. Um, the kitty has committed a terrible crime. But he has no shame in his eyes. And I had a lot of fun with this painting. Of course, the Dostoevsky's book um, went with the actual painting when the couple bought the original. But I do a lot of book paintings. Um, but I think the most fun about doing this show is that I get to meet the people that look at my work. 
and it, everyone has a story. And sometimes my customers come by and they'll share an experience with me, and then I get excited about it, and it ends up in a painting the next season. So I have a lot of fun, and just a book or a bird can really, um, this I just did a couple days ago, and I already sold it. It's just silly. It's two male finch sitting on a branch, and they're looking at something. So it's called, check out the legs on that bird. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pete. <laughs> Some of the titles weren't appropriate, but we went with that one. <laughs> I do my best. <laughs> Um, last year, I, or maybe the year before, I started a little series called Friends in High Places. And the first one, I think, was a, a deer. There are a bunch of chickadees on top of his antlers. So this was another one in the series. Um, the great blue parent, of course, is a champion fisherman. So is the kingfisher. And he was teaching a fly catcher how to catch a fish. And the secret to catching fish is using gummy worms for bait. <laughs> So now everybody keeps bringing me bags of gummy worms. Thank you. <laughs> um, anyway, it's a lot of fun, and I've got another one going with a great blue hair. And I think I just enjoy when people come in and take a closer look at the work, and if it makes you smile. It's not necessarily deep, but I love the laughter, and it's fun to share those stories. And that's um, one of my favorite things to do. The birds. Um, my late father was a bird carver. Um, he was actually a banker, but his hobby was carving birds. And he, I grew up, he was always saying paint birds, and I never listened to him. Um, but he had a stroke, and it was in my early years of doing this show, and really couldn't communicate um, any longer. So I started to paint small paintings of birds, and each little painting was named after one of his best friends. And I show them to him and make bring a smile to his face. But it caught on, and people started to buy the birds, you know, request more with their favorite books or baseball mitts. I do, you know, or antiques. And anyway, so it grew to this series of birds and art, and a kind of accidental twist in what I was painting. But it had a blast, and so it's a tribute to my late father. Insecurities. 
I hide mine with my humor. I'm as nervous as shit right now, right? And I've got collectors out there, but it's the connection about my work that I love. You know, uh, we call it a story, but really it's a philosophical observation of why we make decisions based on our experiences and the society around us. And as I said, we're <coughs> in society here, so not only he's a great looking fella, but Trevor actually is, take it back. <laughs> He's also part of the piece that inspired it, along with Sandra. And you heard that I, we spoke about one of the, the names of Barbara's piece, and that came out of it. So, we're right with what the stories are. But what I realized was when I was traveling, was the difference between house and a home is you. You create the home. And the center of the home is the couch. We come home, we sit back, we feel comfortable and secure. But it's got nothing to do with the furnishings. It's got to do with you. You've created that feeling. So I place the furniture in the pieces. And it's only recently I realized it's a juxtapose in the actual piece, but it's also a juxtapose in our life. Because anytime you feel comfortable in your life, you're not going to progress. Comfort kills people's dreams. So the inspiration, as I say, comes from conversations. I love comedy, I love music. And this is why I actually chose this piece, even though it's one of my smaller pieces. <laughs> but it actually does show exactly that. There's the three elements that I was just discussing that brought this piece together. Because the conversation with Trevor here, we're three months together. If you ever come up to our corner, we get into a routine of comedy up the back if we're high on coffee, and it's very hard to stop. So through that, we, we digest why we do things, why we say things, and that's where a lot of the stuff comes from. So I love New York because I can use the billboards in order to help tell the story. And if you look down the bottom here, everybody is in communication. It's just not with each other. So they don't even see the giraffe there. Thank you, Sandra. <coughs> right? So we go into this digital era. The Match.com, the Facebook, the popular computer, the avatar. And there's this discussion of why is this so scary towards this thing? And I realized the social cues that we feel we're lacking, that we're missing. And when you're doing it digitally, you don't see if you've offended somebody. Now, there's certain rules of society that are unspoken. Some of them, if you notice, I'll have a lot of balloons in my pieces. Because whether you're religious or not, morality and value rises above all the shit. And that's something that society really does need in order to benefit from it. And I'm, I'm painting the piece and I realize this song comes on, Disposition. Sweet Disposition. I'm like, God, that's the piece. So the actual lyrics of the song, it's a moment in time, a kiss, a cry, our dreams, our lives, our rights and wrongs, as we are only young, if we carry those virtues throughout us, we're going to be okay as a society no matter where we go. Now, I also bring in certain things, like little things that are hidden in there. Despicable Me, if you remember the movie Despicable Me, it discusses, it discusses the fact where the evil guy is trying to steal the moon. And he needs the orphans to get into his nemesis place in order to help get their plans. But the fact is, at the very end, he ends up with a relationship with the orphans, which was more important than his stealing of the moon. It's a kid's story with a great morality to it. Now, if you look on the bottom here, I told you why I put the chair in there, but all these little elements around there. I was listening to a, a, a comedian, and he was discussing back in the day, his mum used to have the cake, the tea cake, and the coffee. And she put it up there. If anybody comes, we'll bring it out, right? Don't you touch it. If somebody comes to my house, we'll bring it out, we'll have a little discussion. Friends come over, we sit down and we discuss what happens these days. Someone knocks on the door, you're like, who the hell's there? Did you text somebody? Right? Turn the lights off. Turn the lights off, that's right. You, you know the comedy skill. And I was laughing because it's so funny how we've changed in a society in order to deem that. But yet there's still, like I say, this connection. Because Trevor, He's connected more to his kids through texting. It's a lot easier to discuss things back and forth. And that's what I realized. Hold on, there is an importance in this. Because as a kid, I remember, it was so difficult to discuss stuff. I'm a parent now. My, my parents let me in on the deal. When they drove is when they asked the questions. Because then I didn't have to look at them and be embarrassed. Right? So as you can see, this conversation, the connection that we all have, we all have these feelings. Just sometimes we don't bring them out. <laughs> Ready to keep going? I'm not done with you. Oh, <laughs> that's what she said. But anyway, <laughs> you do. I told you to come out. Let me grab a drink. <laughs> so, yeah, as we were discussing, the fact that I travel, 
I was unsatisfied. I was trying to be that in kid at school. And I never got to that point. And I look back now and I realize those in kid, kids never made it to anything. Where the fact was being uncomfortably comfortable, or comfortably uncomfortable, should I say, was actually gave this, this fight to travel and search for more. The unsatisfaction get me, got me to release and go traveling. Now, it sounds great that I was doing all this, but there was a lot of toughness in that. Because when I left, I didn't mean to. All I carried with me was my backpack, surfboards and clothes would change depending on where I would go. I had my backpack, pliers, screwdrivers. That's all I had. And it sounds such a great thing, but it was actually very difficult to release. To release from my family, my home, the security that I had built, a job. You know, there's something about security being in a job which this, this doesn't really allow, you know? But I got used to it. And that's when I realized there's something about this growing and, and striving and the challenges that we really go for. And as I say, as I traveled, I realized experiences in everybody is what makes our, us make our decisions based upon that, our fears. And that's when I realized we're all very similar. You know, we all have those things at hide us. It's just what changes us is what we adapted to, if that makes sense. Oh, tap and pedal or something. So, yeah, I, I had a lot of failures along the way. I started out, this show's been really great. In fact, I see a lot of collectors out here. It's the connection, I thank you for supporting my bad <coughs> habit of being creative. And it was this connection in this show, I struggled. Um, and it does mean a lot. This show did, did turn over my whole life. A lot of people know the story here who, who are actually here. It was my second year where I came into this. As I said, I wasn't an artist. I wasn't even that good when I started. The first time I started painting was with the company I was building trade show booths for. I started painting a mural with them and they actually called me the mud guy. You know, seeing this now, I'm, I, I still can't believe I paint this. You know, I can't believe I did all those travels, standing on Machu Picchu, climbing, you know, volcanoes, whatever it was that I was doing. It just feels like somebody else. And the same when I look at the piece. But I came in here thinking that, you know, my tropical scenes, which is what I used to paint, because that's what I was related to, was what was going to connect people. But what I realized, it was my tranquility. It was my marijuana of art, you could say, because I tried to calm down this overthinking mind. And I think it was my second year, and it was one of the big struggles where I'd hit dirt bottom on my creative life. And I'd been searching for myself. And I'd hit, uh, I think it was the eighth week, which we just passed. And I really didn't have a conversation with anybody, let alone make a sale. Now, society deems the man to support the family. I've got a wife and daughter. I kid you not, I was high on coffee, stressed out, couldn't make a sale. And I'd been looking for my own voice for a long time. And during the, the nights, I'd be working hard. And there was some key artists in this area. This is the community that we live in, in this tent. Some key artists would come over, try and support me. There's not much you can do outside of, you know, just a little bit of support, it's like a broken heart in a way. They would leave their artwork in my booth so I could paint all night. And I said, uh, I, I promised I wouldn't use the F word. But I used it and said, I'm just gonna paint something. I said, yeah, I told you I would. <laughs> but um, I said, I'm gonna just paint something from out of my head here. And it was sort of out of my head, but it was a photo I'd taken years ago where I grabbed a couch and put it on a train track while I was traveling. It was well before I was even an artist. And I started painting this scene. And you know, people would come over and they'd try to be supportive try and go, you know, hey, should I do this, do that? And I had my own vision of where I wanted to go, but it was frustrating, it was super frustrating. Nothing's easy. The challenges are what makes us grow. Throwing paint at it, wiping it off, but all of a sudden this conversation in my head, let alone the conversation with people as they're going by, I realized I was onto something. And that's when I came up with this whole couch set because the fact was, the couch represented quite a lot to me. I was looking for a couch in the house, and I'm the fussy one from there. My wife's like, just buy the damn couch. I'm like, that's not the couch I want. Which one do you want? I got no idea, but that's not the one I want, right? So I realized that it wasn't the couch I was looking for. It was actually the home. All those travels, I traveled by myself. And it was actually my wife and daughter that was my home. And that's when I realized I still have the same damn couch after all those years. We got a new place, but it doesn't matter. It's still home inside of here. And that's really what I was looking for in my pieces. And that's what the connection is. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Really, and, and each of you have 
evolved and trans transitioned in the years I've known you. And I think that's one of the, again, one of the things about the show and interacting with you, the collectors, the viewers, that has such an impact on you. And you might each, you kind of touched on that, you can speak to that some more, but, um, and you, you sort of skimmed over that eight week period when you, you're like, what's wrong with me? Nobody's connecting. Well, you, you weren't connecting with your work and then that flipped and literally changed the trajectory well, you, you say eight weeks, but it was actually longer than that. I, it, it, another funny story is um, Jem Rains, and I give her all the credit. Um, she's one of the artists up the back here. I, I ran into her um, when I thought, hey, this could be a cool life. As I said, when I first started, they called me the mud guy. When I was painting the mural, I had no idea what to do. Um, and it just shows that drive and passion, I believe, beats talent in a lot of ways. And she actually, I went into a show and she was standing there um, she was pregnant with the first kid, you know, if you don't know her, she's a cute little lady, obviously the belly was as tall as what she is. And she's standing there painting and I asked her, you know, how do I be an artist? And she still has a story that here I am, I just got down to the surf, I was all salty, I had this little hot rat surf girlfriend at the time. And, <laughs> was this life? Sorry Liz, that's my wife. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> okay. So, yeah, and she tells the story how I went up to her and I asked, how do I become an artist? How do I get into this creative life? And she gave me some pointers. And from then on, I started taking it and working with these pointers, and it was very valuable in my career. And she actually got me into this show as well. Um, she paid a lot of money to get it. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you refunded it. <laughs> But I had been looking for my voice for a long time. So this was a condensed eight weeks here. It was really, it was the, the slap in the face that I needed. But I'd been looking for my voice. And the thing is, I know that I can paint anything, but I wanted to paint something that I had sacrificed everything for. You know, I gave up my home. As I said, when I traveled, I gave up my family, I gave up my country, I gave up the security of everything. And I made a choice where I, as I said, I, I traveled 10 years and I've filled three passports. I've gone through 25 different countries just surfing my butt off, doing whatever I want, which was, at the end, very easy. But then the next step was, well, what do I do now? And I flipped a coin, and I, I pretty much literally, I said, if I could sell a painting, I'd stay. If I can't, I go back home, because either way, I'm gonna lose something and I'm gonna gain something. I'm gonna lose the country I love and the surf I love, but I'd have to be an electrician. Nothing wrong with that. It's just a different style of life. Or I live the creative life, and I live in a country where my family's away and the surf is consistent, but it's not great. Now, obviously, as we were discussing, surf is a big thing in my life. And so it was a weird story, but it was a long way around and I did end up selling stuff. So I, I realized I was on the right path, but then the next thing was connecting with people. And what I noticed with my tropical scene was everybody was becoming <coughs> tranquil with it. So they would like it, but they would walk away. You can see I'm, I'm a very, passionate, open guy. I wanted my work to be in the center of everybody's house. I didn't know how to do that. No one can tell you how to do that. And so it came to that point after eight weeks of frustration and so forth. So it's, it would be the same thing as how long did it take for you to paint this? Well, it took me 15 years because it was everything that built up into the piece. And that's how I ended up finding myself. And it just happened to be the turning point at this show, but it also happened to be the support I needed by all the other artists. Susan and Jake were a big, Jake can turn around. Thank you very much. Were a big part of the support because they actually came and found me at another show and saw what I was doing and really gave me some props to it. So I knew I was on the right level there. So yeah, there's, there's a lot to being an artist and, and it's just not the creative way. You're putting yourself out, out on the line. And, and that's why I like comedians. Comedians will fail in front of you. And so they have to get themselves back up. We can put the painting away but that doesn't mean we get to stop, if that makes sense. But we're still putting it out there. And as I say, we're all spoke about being nervous standing up in front of you, and yet we know all you guys. And that's just a natural thing. So. I remember his first few years, and you were painting surfboards, tropical scenes, and we had to throw sedatives at him, calm down, and look what he, 
But what he's created, he's amazing. You have to see his booth if you haven't seen it yet. It's really incredible what you've done. And, and he's a lot of fun, but there's a great support system here with all of us um, artists who kind of help each other. So if we get stuck, if we have instant inspiration, then it's really a great team. And we have stories to, to share with one another as well. And it helps us all grow as artists. I think that's really kind of a good segue into a lot of collectors have asked when they come to these events, we talk a lot about how, to, how you do it, why you do it, but um, there is a lot to being an artist and the, and the struggle that goes with it and, and sacrifice, you know, and many people are away from their families. Even if they live here, we're all here seven days a week for ten weeks, so that definitely plays into the art that you do and inspires you, but it's also why the connection to the collectors is so important. And I know, again, all of you have done custom work before, and you feed off the energy that visitors bring into you. And like you'll do uh, your big New York City uh, with the dream big, the dream big stuff. Yeah, there's actually a few. I see some hands going up because you know what? Because you're proud, and I'm so stoked. I am so stoked that you've connected. That's what it is about. You know, I'm, just, I'm pointing to a couple of people here who I did a beautiful piece, and there's a few of you guys, so thank you too, I've done a lot of that too, where I've commissioned, not just something for me, but for them. They come with me, we sit down, I think it took us three years, correct? And um, it was back and forth, and it's very funny because it does become very, very personal, where I'm telling their story. They're giving me images, um, we're discussing certain things, some things I don't want to know, right? <laughs> but I, I place them in the billboards, and I bring the story all the way around, to actually t to bring in their life and their stories. Because again, we all have stories, you know? And, and that's one of the things I've been using. I'll come on a theme with some of my pieces. Right now I have cats, like tigers, cheetahs, and so forth, just a little bit. And I'm guessing Trevor is a big influence for that because he's a beautiful wildlife artist. Um, and, and a great painter. He's all right, man. He's beautiful. <laughs> um, but have you seen him? He's handsome ass. He's playing words But. I've been putting books in there because the books represent the fact this is your story. And then I have the pages blowing away because there's going to be bad chapters in your life. But if you've ever watched the biography, there's always bad parts of your life or bad parts of that story that builds that character. And that's why you love them because they went through it. And I guess that's what separates people from achieving what they want and not achieving what they want. Because some people sit back and feel comfortable because they hit that level of failure where they don't want to hit it anymore. And so they create this life of comfort, but they sit there and wonder, how did that person go on to succeed? Well, that person understood that failure is a lesson in life. And if you don't accept those lessons, you'll never go on to achieve what you want. It might not be exactly what you want, but that's a muscle that you'll grow and use somewhere else in life. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, that there's struggle in everybody's life. Successful people go through the struggle and find the gift. And, you know, we've all known each other a long time, so we've, we've all been through a lot. But um, we do love our collectors, and all of you are what makes the show so special. And we actually have somebody here who is a special day. So I want to say happy birthday to my friend Ken Zilstra. No, don't be embarrassed. When you think about this show and how long we've known so many of you, I mean, this is every every week we see faces that are familiar. But um, how many years? Twenty-five. Twenty-five. We've known each other, Jeanette. I've known you since before. Like beginning. So Kenny, I've known you a good 15, 20 years. <laughs> but that. That's what I hope that you kind of hear that and let it resonate when, when the artists talk about their work. And today we're talking about story, but every artist in this tent has grown tremendously through the interaction with all of you, and we felt that support and that connection. And, and you know, you definitely see it show up in unexpected ways in their work, and again, in how they interact with each other. So. Um, We'd love to get questions from the audience, and I, I'm sure you guys have more story to share. So pop, feel free to pop in as you think of something. Um, oh yeah, we're, uh, um, oh, 
we're hogging all the microphones down here. <laughs> but any questions from our lovely group of guests today? Anyone from Facebook? Yeah. Okay, there was Facebook one. question is? Um, it was for Pete. It was your painting, um, Scandalous. Why one of the Marriott signs is backwards. Okay, repeat the question. <laughs> okay, um, we're discussing the piece Scandalous, which actually inspired Sandra mm -hmm. George's beautiful piece. Scandalous was a turning point in my life. Um, there, if you look at my work, as I say, I'll hide things in there. And the piece they're talking about is a New York scene. I don't, do love New York because New York is a social jungle. And what I had done on one side, put all of New York, and it talks about the more mature of the uh, society. And so things are backwards. The Virgin Records store is actually gone. Um, the, the label is written backwards for a reason. It's because the whole piece discusses the fact that we're led to believe that we're all united, we're all one. And you know that's not true. We never can see eye to eye, but we have to have respect for each other. And it's something that I wanted to show in the piece because when you look at the other side, it's, oh, sorry about that. If you look on the other side, it's actually all the right way around, but it's not noticeable until I actually point it out. And then it goes through the billboards discussing exactly that kids shouldn't have to go through all these things, trying to be scandalous or you know be on the phones 24-7, instead of actually having these conversations, getting to know, it, know each other. Yet, it's in contradiction again to what we we're saying, because the fact is, if we're talking about conversations, the phone is a big part of what society is now. And so the conversation can be put in the right way. We just can't abuse it in certain manners. There's a lot to see in all their arts. Works of art. Arts of work? <laughs> right. Uh, okay, other questions? Oh, wow. This is so And no, I'm not getting paid to do this. <laughs> oh, he's been paid. It's just not financially. <laughs> get to the next surf spot when I traveled. Um, some of those things were a little saucy, but one of the things I used to do is I was one of the original pedicab riders um, in downtown San Diego. Um, I was just looking for some extra money to get to the next next place. In fact, uh, I ended up from there driving from San Diego all the way to Costa Rica in a little van for like $900. Unbelievable. I, my mate actually said, do you know where Costa Rica is? I'm like, I got no idea, but I'm going, you know? It was an unbelievable trip, and it taught me a lot. It taught me a lot. But the, the pedicab was a way and a means to get to the next spot. And I used to sit in front of this gallery in downtown, waiting for the next client. And uh, the owner would come out and talk to me, because he would always sit out the front and get a cigarette, when you could actually smoke in the streets of California. And uh, I loved this one artist, and he was all over the front of the gallery, and I was like, wow, you know, it's awesome. Just before I even realized I could paint. Um, What's funny now is I'm that artist. I'm standing, I'm, I'm out the front painting, but it's all my work in the front. I've taken up their whole gallery. It's my number one gallery. And I had the conversation the last show with a pedicab writer, which was a reflection on the fact that I had that conversation with the other artist that year. And I was like, wow, this is just a cycle of life, you know? As long as he doesn't take out my spot, I'll be happy. <laughs>
So I paint and show with other realism artists. Um, and that keeps me striving to do my best possible work. And uh, it's been really good for me to be here as well. Um, love Susan and Jake. It's been fabulous to be with the other artists. We all kind of help each other grow, to be honest. And you all are a big part of it, too. Is there a painting that's your biggest challenge that you were like, when you finally got done? Um, I think whatever I'm working on, I mean, the little ones kind of, you know, are kind of quick, but sometimes in the middle of summer, when everybody's gone and you know you're not here and the artists aren't here, maybe Trevor knows because he lives in Arizona too. It's hot and it's quiet. You just sort of are in your studio and it's all a challenge because you want to stay inspired and you have to get out. You got to go out to nature and and um, then you come back refreshed and then I can finish. But I, I get stuck sometimes on things, but somehow I pull through. How about you, Seth? So it's always a struggle. Um, what sometimes what happens is you do a piece and it's very successful, and then you think, how do I outdo myself? You know, and that is a struggle sometimes because sometimes you think you're done and you've completed the series, and can you go on? And you might get stuck. Like a writer has writer's block. You you have artist block sometimes, and. Um, it is a struggle. What I think what helps um, is doing shows because if if you didn't do shows, there'd be no pressure to to complete another body of work or whatever. And the shows really uh, it's stressful, but it pushes you. And within, it's almost like I guess it's like giving birth. You know, it's like painful and stressful, but then you finally produce a piece and it's better than your last one. So then you go, okay, I still have it, okay. Because <laughs> it can, it can, you know, as artists you do get insecure. Um, especially if you're, you know, there's days when you're invisible at a show like this or any show and people walk by and you think, oh, what am I doing wrong, you know? And then you realize then the next day everybody's looking at your work. So it's, it's, it's a mind thing and you have to keep your mind uh, kind of in the right place, and it's just always a struggle, but um, it, it always works out somehow. One question a couple sessions ago is, when did you know that you were, your career was to be an artist? Like there was no backup plan. Well, with me it was a little different because I started with um, commercial photography, and I was assisting, and then I went into stylist assisting, they got paid more, but it was very hard grunt work, like on big big sets for car shoots and uh, product shoots and all kinds of things. And it was a lot of hard work. Um, and I started, I went to Italy and I started uh, doing these little pieces that were from my trip. And they were, uh, back then it was like Polaroid transfers. And, um, and I was showing it to some of my peers I was working with and they were like, oh, these are really nice. Can I buy one? And I was like, really? You'd want to buy this? And um, and that kind of got me, because I had no confidence. I had zero, I wouldn't show my work to anyone. I was totally scared to death to, to show a body of work. Well, I didn't really have a body of work, but I had little bits and pieces. But I'd been doing art since I was a kid, so I liked, I knew I wanted to be an artist or an athlete, and I wasn't going to be an athlete, so. <laughs> um, so, I, I think um, what happened was when people started paying attention to it and saying, oh, can I have one of those? Uh, I'd like to buy it. And these are people that way above me in, in the, you know, creatively at that point. And I was like, you want one of these? You know? <laughs> okay. So that kind of got me. And then doing shows, you know, I think um, Pete was talking about it. You're really laying yourself out in front of people. I mean, your work is a direct representation of, of something about you. And so you're kind of putting yourself out there. And, you know, people can say things like, oh, that's ugly, or, you know, or that's, you know, whatever. And, um, and you just have to have, you just figure, okay, you know, it's like art, it, if people think your art is bad, that's good too, because, you know, 
it, it doesn't matter. Um, At least they're looking. They're looking and they're making a comment. It's, it's making a reaction. So if it's bad to them, it's not going to be bad to everyone. But showing my work uh, to the public as opposed to being in a gallery where you don't meet people has really built my confidence because I, uh, my own family was like, um, when I first started out, they would sit, because my husband's a photographer too, and they would say, um, I go, look at this, what I did. And they go, oh, that's really cool. Uh, but, but you just printed it, right? Tim did it, right? And I'm like, uh, no, I did it. Oh, it's really beautiful, but you didn't do it, did you? So this is what I came from, like this, like, you can't do that. So it's really been a struggle. And having uh, an art show, now I'm getting a bit pumped. <laughs> You're invincible. Um, but people, you know, telling you all day long that they love your work it really helps. This is what it's about, it's the emotion. You know, that's a great, do you mind if I grab a segue? This, this sort of thing happens a lot, you know. Um, we do put ourselves out in the line. I, I embrace the fact that we get, we're, <laughs> you know, it is, it, it, it's a support group, but it's also the fact that there's something about becoming emotional. We do put ourselves out there. As I say, Trevor and I have had so many stories where people have cried in my booth. I cry over the same story about supporting my family because it is so emotional. The day I don't cry over it, I'm, I'm upset because it doesn't hit me as much as what it does, right? But then we've had stories <laughs> that are... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say, yeah. They go the other direction. No, no but, it, but it's it's actually people putting themselves out on the line when they've said, oh, I can't believe I'm telling you this story right now. Because there's an openness to it. You know, we, we've opened up ourselves. Yeah, we've opened up ourselves in order to take this, to grab this. This is emotional for us, yet it's, it's a contradiction in the fact that we're making a living from it. It's something we all, I believe, struggle from this. You know. I'm, I strive for perfectionism, and I'm so stoked never to get that level. I am nervous every time I start a painting. If I ever reach the top of the mountain, I would be bored shitless. You know, this isn't what it's about. It's those struggles, it's the challenges, it's putting yourself out in the line, but then the satisfaction of connecting, whether you buy the piece or just connect to have this, some stories <laughs> told to you, where people open up to you, is, I couldn't think of a better life. You know, I could be, go, go back to being an electrician, as I said. I loved it, I really did. There was something giving. I, I would dig a hole, I would sit down and have a beer, and go, gosh, I did some great work. I would sit there in front of my damn easel and paint for 16 hours straight and never have the same satisfaction as what I did at digging a hole. There's something manual about that. But this connection, I could never get from anything I did because I could charge you for this. The bill, you'd be stoked. I could charge it for the outlet, and they cry, and why the hell did you charge me so much? <laughs> you know, there's a connection, that's why. Because there's a value in this. And it's an interesting point to realize that you're supporting, again, my creative habits. Our super creative habits. You know, as I say, I bring Trevor up here because I, I needed the support personally between these two beautiful creative women. And that's what this is all about, the support, the creative from you guys and from each other. Um, we always feel very blessed to have so many amazing artists amongst us, and um, doubly blessed that we have so many of you who love what they do so much that you want to come and support the artists and what they do. And um, there's so many stories from everybody, and you are all definitely a part of that story. And I don't know if you guys recognize the gratitude that everybody here feels for you and the thrill that the collectors come here and want to take something home. And I like to remind our artists that on any given day, we've got 100 or so artists every year in this show, 29 years, there's lots of art across the world that's come from here. And I shared a story a few years ago about finding some art in Naples, Florida that I knew came from here at a, at a critical, you know, pivotal moment in our life. But just the idea that I always tell the artists that every day there's somebody somewhere in the world, across the country, that looks at their work of art 
and it makes them feel good. It makes them smile. So that's what I think we all strive to deliver to you, and we are happy to share with you and grateful for each of you. And I, I really think that's these guys have done a great job capturing the story story, but the bottom line is they know that there's people that are inspired by and uplifted by, or sometimes challenged by, their works of art all across the country and the world. So, um, if, are there any other questions, or should we give our... Thank you everyone.